study, um, uh, I run a project called uh, Open Source Malaria, uh, which is funded <coughs> by the Australian government and the Medicines for Malaria Venture in New Zealand. And um, it has a, a certain structure which I just wanted to share. These presentations here are quite short, so there's no chance to talk through a lot of the associated science. But I thought I'd instead I'd focus on how the project functions um, as, a, as a beginning discussion point for maybe this, this whole session. Um, and the intention is to demo as a pilot to demonstrate a, um, a way of collaborating um, which embodies the extreme form of openness, I suppose. Um, and uh, these rules for, of engagement which were devised on day one were that they arose from another project that I ran with, the, uh, with WHO TDR to develop a, a method of uh, synthesizing enantiopure prosequantal uh, for schistosomiasis, so uh, of interest for a pediatric formulation of the drug. And we ran that project for a, a year or two, uh, again, a completely openly. Um, and we received a lot of inputs from the community or whatever, but the, that project, uh, how we ran that project, how it was run most effectively, were distilled down to these six rules for this malaria project, which we advised on day one and which have served the project quite well. Um, so what I wanted to do just for the next five minutes or so is run through um, these one by one to give, just to highlight them and to talk a little bit about uh, examples of, of, of what these rules mean for the project. Uh, if you want to see more about it, the web page is there. Um, and just a, a nod to some of the work that we've done in the last few years on this. It's a small scale project as a pilot, essentially me and a, and a postdoc and, and, uh, and then the community of people who've contributed. Um, which numbers about 100 people so far um, in, the, in the last three years. And uh, we, we've done essentially hit to lead projects um, derived in the first three series from the GlaxoSmithKline Triscantos data, uh, antimalarial data set. And the series four arose from uh, Pfizer, from Sandwich, before they closed. Um, and series four is the, is the current leader, I guess, uh, and that's the series which has the most effort on it. Uh, the other three series were parked for uh, one reason or another. Um, but it's small molecule work, um, hit to lead projects, um, using a, a community network of people to do the, to do the science. Um, and my lab, uh, I guess, runs it because we're funded to do so. So the first rule that was shown there <clears throat> was that all data and ideas are freely shared. And it's the central rule in the sense that the project is not about running um, the science in a lab, and then at some future point, um, you publish the data. The idea is that you share all the data as they are acquired. So the key technology really is the online lab notebook on the top left. Um, so instead of using a, a book constructed of paper and a pen, you record your results, synthesis, biological evaluation, whatever, and you put those in the lab notebook. But the lab notebook resides online, so you can see every day what's going on. So if we went to the lab book, notebook now, you'd see the molecules that were made yesterday. And the idea behind that is that people can see what you're doing immediately, and if you're going to make a mistake, that can be pointed out to you by the community, but through a process of peer review, before you then go on for the six months along that blind alley. So the idea is people can, can change the direction of the project as it's going. And that's happened repeatedly, that people have advised we change direction or do something different. Um, and it also means that if people want to participate, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, they are up to speed with where the project is. So they, they don't do something which has already been done or which is seen as being uh, redundant. Um, all the data that's generated for, um, on, on biological activity of molecules is put in freely available resources, and we've heard about that today already. So Campbell uh, has um, not, is not, a, not an up-to-date resource for it, but there's batch uploads of activity. Um, and social media helps with alerting for project needs to the, to the wider community. So it's a very effective way of reaching uh, lots of people. Um, meetings can be recorded and placed online so that you can plan for the next couple of months and people know where you're going. Uh, and, and those are on YouTube and so on. Um, and even things to do with project management can be managed in the, in the public domain. So, uh, you know, at the moment we have 120 or so active things that need doing on the project and those are listed on a piece of software called GitHub, which is used by software developers the world over. Um, it's not intended for that purpose, but it has a very useful issue tracker. So if you need something done, you post it there, you assign someone, you assign a date. And, and you work on that until it's done, and then you close it and disappear. So there's lots of tools already out there that you can use to run projects, uh, largely from the software community, who really have pioneered lots of different things, but which can be repurposed for use in drug discovery. And if you want to read about the, the different components of this, you know, we haven't built a platform here. Lots of people like ResearchGator building platforms. Don't, you don't really need to do that. You can just use things that already exist. 
And so if you want to read about the paper on the bottom there um, is a summary of, of how these things run. It's open access, obviously. Um, the second rule was anyone can take part, and this is a very important part of, of it. So it, it needs to be a, a sort of a, a arranged in a way that people can jump on board and contribute if they're well placed to do so. And what you want, of course, is to attract people with expertise that the project needs. You know, so if in this case we wanted three molecules made, the ones in that little poster there that my postdoc made up, wanted active or inactive. I thought it was quite quite neat. Uh, and one of those molecules, the sulfonamide SE, was a molecule that an undergraduate in my lab was having difficulty making. Um, but a postgrad in Edinburgh uh, called Patrick Thompson saw that we needed that molecule and thought he had a better way of making it. So he just went ahead and did it in his own lab, recording the data in our lab notebook, uh, in, in well, the lab notebook. Um, and you know we didn't know this guy, um, uh, but didn't need to trust him because all the data have to be shared. So he did the work and put the data in the, in the lab notebook and then linked out. It's like collaboration by Twitter, but it's quite effective because there's a lab notebook in the background where all the raw data are, are shown so that you can check what's, so the spectrum on the bottom right there is one of these molecules. You can check what he's doing. You don't need to trust the guy. Um, and eventually uh, he, uh, he made some molecules for the project and sends those to a lab that's local, in his case uh, Dundee, um, and gets those evaluated against the same controls that we're using in Sydney. Um, and in this case they were inactive, but it's a nice contribution to the work because it's, it's, an, it's an obvious, he was trying to make a sulfonamide as the isosteer for the ester, which was problematic. Um, and so it's an important data, data point for the paper, and so he gets authorship on that as a result of doing that. But he's working completely independently, we're not paying him, and we didn't meet him until about a year after this. Um, so that it's important that he's able to do that so he knows that his contribution will be valued um, and is not already been dealt with by somebody else. So that's why the real time aspect of this is not just a gimmick, it helps keep people up to speed with where you are. Um, similarly, this kind of approach is very amenable to crowdsourcing, obviously. So if you demonstrate a synthetic approach to something, um, to get the chemistry sorted out, then you can crank out a bunch of analogs which you might need for the project, quite simply, um, with a larger workforce of students. And this was done by, again, by someone who came to the project because he could see what we were doing. Um, a small liberal arts college, I think, just north of Chicago. And he had about 50 undergraduates make some uh, six novel molecules by this multiple step approach. Um, and one of those was new and potent. And so the undergrads were able to then you know, get involved in a real research project, um, but also um, uh, make a contribution uh, as part of a larger cohort and get some synthesis done quite quickly. Um, rule three was about patents, so there'll be no patents, and we put that in just to avoid any shadow of a doubt about what's going on. Because you disclose everything daily, you can't take patents, obviously, um, because everything's in the public domain. But we wanted to make it clear that, that you know, there, there would at no stage be any, any intent to patent anything. Um, that's just to sort of clarify the rules um, a little bit. Um, and two things to say about that. One is that, of course, lots of people in NTD research complain about patents inhibiting research, and, and any restriction on sharing is obviously going to in, it slow down your science. Um, and it's, it's known in science and lots of other fields too. Um, just harking back to software again, where the idea of open source comes from, maybe I should define the term open source in case there's any doubt, because some people think it's the same thing as open access, uh, which is where you can read papers, um, or open innovation, which has nothing to do with open source. Um, open, in open source, you, um, the code of something is available, can be downloaded, changed by anybody, and re-uploaded um, to the project center. So in the way that um, I can go and modify the Wikipedia entry for malaria now, um, I can do it now without any, re any restriction on me. Um, I don't have to ask anyone's permission, I just go and do it. Um, and so software like Firefox and Linux, very powerful bits of software are open source, so constructed by a wide network of people in a very democratic fashion uh, where anybody can participate in that. Um, so it's very different from open innovation, which is often based on prize models and people still doing research in silos and not really talking to each other, um, which doesn't really change anything. Uh, open source is very specific about everyone has access to everything all the time, um, and it's, that's very distinct. So the, uh, half of us in the room have Android phones, right? Android, the operating system, is open source, as, as distinct from iOS, which is very much not. Um, so uh, so it, it's meant to be mimicking this, and in software, if you speak to 100 software coders, 99 of them will be against patents because it inhibits the flow of code and information. Um, number four is suggestion to the best form of criticism, which is intended to remind people to be polite. That's what, on, on, if you've ever been on an online discussion forum, people rapidly start to become unpleasant to each other. Uh, and in science, you can't have that. So the idea is you need to think that rather than just criticizing, you've got to suggest things. 
And here's an example of this on the first series we did in open source malaria way back. Um, we, uh, we had some molecules that uh, looked a little bit like these PANES compounds that Jonathan Bale at Monash has talked about, these pan-assay interference compounds, these frequent promiscuous hitters in high-throughput screening. Um, and he noticed this and came to the website and wrote that you know, we might want to be careful about, about this. Um, and uh, but my undergrad um, overnight went back to the original GSK paper and found that actually they'd already screened out the promiscuous hitters. And so wrote that on the thing. And then he came back and said, that's, a, that's well answered, Zoe. And Zoe's this undergrad, and Jonathan Bell's a professor. But they were able to have this polite conversation online uh, because, because actually they hadn't met. So it actually helps sometimes that you have people discussing things online because then you don't get that kind of hierarchy. <clears throat> um, so suggestions like that are very good, very powerful. And, and that was very helpful of Jonathan. And he's continued to engage with the project on this issue to make sure that we're steering away from these promiscuous compounds. And the number five of six was um, public discussion is better than email. Email is a hopeless medium for doing science because you are talking with one other person or you get CC'd into a bunch of emails you don't want to read. Uh, much better to have these conversations on, uh, on open platforms. Um, and, we, and we embrace this quite a lot. Um, uh, so as one example, we, we have at the moment a very active um, discussion about how we can take the molecules that are uh, discovered and, and described in open source malaria and have a, um, a, a one page which lists all the, all the compound structures and their potencies in a way that's interactive. So in the way that Kemble does, but one which is updated constantly. Um, and there are surprisingly no free tools for this. We, we didn't realize this, but there's no free way of doing an SAR table um, using a piece of software that you don't have, have to buy. And so we've been discussing this a lot. And, and the discussion is very good because it brings people in. So someone has been brought into this conversation because they can see the conversation happening. Someone has been brought in who has a solution to this. So we now have a working solution for this problem, a web page with all the molecules. Um, but that happened because the, the, the conversation was happening in the open. So again, people come to the project because they can see what you're struggling with. <clears throat> Nothing more motivating than watching someone do something badly. Right? Because you just can't help yourself except to step in and say, no, no, no. You don't want to do that. You want to do this. It's in our bones as scientists, I think. Um, and the last one is, is that uh, the project is not owned by any one lab. So it's very important for Wikipedia, for example, that it's not called Jimmy Wales' encyclopedia. right? Because if it was called that, no one will contribute. It has to be a project which exists independently of the people. So with open source malaria, the idea is that we, we, we operate it in a way that if we stopped tomorrow, people could carry on. We'd have to give people a couple of passwords, that's all. But other people could then continue with it, because it's based on an open platform that anybody can use. Um, and, and this is very important, really, because then open source projects, they don't uh, die once the team finishes. Um, if you talk to any software coder who, who writes a piece of code on the laptop, uh, and you, you talk to them about longevity of code, they'll say the only way to guarantee your code lives forever is to put it in the public domain, to put it in a, in a repository that's open. If you keep it on your computer, it will eventually die. You, you'll lose it. The computer will be stolen. You'll, you'll forget about it or something. Uh, and science is the same, so it helps if you can put all of your positive and negative data in the public domain, and that will live, that will make the project live. And it's terrible to see times where, in the bottom right there, when a uh, farmer closes sites, like Sandwich or in Bangalore, as they close the Bangalore site. You worry about the hemorrhaging of data and expertise that happens uh, when a site is closed, this dreadful loss of, of information. <clears throat> um, and you've seen you know, a bunch of JMED camp papers now on TB coming out of the AZ site. Um, where I think things are being published quickly to make sure that they're in the public domain. But what you want, of course, is the team and the expertise still. So rather than having a paper, you want to know, well, if the team had carried on with this project, what are the next 10 things they would have done? That's really valuable. Um, and with an open source project, you can do that. You can maintain a list of what, you're, what you are going to do next. And people can then resume your work if you want. Um, so uh, just a last little note, a few of us have been uh, getting together uh, last year in a, a, a short conference sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation to examine whether this idea of open source can be translated to the full drug discovery and development pipeline. Uh, and many of the arguments are regulatory and financial rather than scientific. Um, but a bunch of people were interested in that, um, that issue. And so there's this quick advert that uh, there'll be another, the second conference will be happening at this very fancy venue, uh, a castle I can still not pronounce. Um, at the beginning of uh, September, uh, and about 30 people again will be getting together to, to try and iron out some example projects that will demonstrate how open source methods, it, operating along these lines of open source malaria, could function through you know, clinical, where you have to examine different financing models of how you fund this, this kind of work. 
Uh, so if you're interested in that, please try and follow the Twitter handle or, or check back with the, with the website or send me an email or something like that. So thank you very much.